your parents traveling in Europe? No, that's our summer house. <laughs> Ever since Daddy's retired, he's taken up photography. Ah, I wondered why a postcard would have a finger in it. <laughs> Stephanie, Stephanie, hold still. Joanna, I don't know why we have to go through this. I already told you my measurements. I'm afraid I need more to go on than perfect. <laughs> We have to wear stupid costumes anyway. It's a tradition. Now stop complaining. You're going to look beautiful. I already do. <laughs> Dressing up in a colonial gown may excite you, but what about those of us who don't need gimmicks? Hi, Joanna, Stephanie. Look what I got for colonial days. Oh, that's great, George. Doesn't he look handsome? As... Handsome as a person can look in clothing with corners. What's, what's going on? Well, I've got a few more finishing touches to put on your costume for colonial days. Oh, no. Is, is this weekend colonial days? Forsooth, landholder Loudon. <laughs> I have to spend the weekend uh, finishing my book. The, the deadline's Monday. You said you'd have that done. Well, honey, then you shouldn't have bought me that miniature basketball hoop for my waste paper basket. <laughs> it's hard to write with the stands chanting, Loud, loud, loud. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to miss the celebration. Dick, you can't miss colonial days. Yeah, Dick. You'll miss the reenactment of the British siege, the plague of 1724, and the Great Indian Massacre. Well, I'd like to participate, George, if, if only to relive the good times. Well, there's also a strict town ordinance that says everyone has to dress up or else. Or, or else what? You know, I'm not sure. No one's ever dared risk it before. Well, that sounds like cruel and, and vague punishment. Anyway, I'm going to spend the, the weekend in, in my study, so I, I'll have no reason to wear a costume. I can think of one. What's that? I spent two weeks making it. <laughs> oh, that is one. I know, I know. <laughs> Stephanie, you look... Oh, George, don't say I look more beautiful than you've ever seen me. Why not? Because it'll mean I haven't always looked my best and that my entire existence has been a stupid, useless, pointless waste. Oh. I've shoveled stuff that looked better than you. Well, how do I look? Boy, you look a lot better than Stephanie does, that's for sure. Let's not overdo it, George. Where's Dick? Stalling. I don't think he likes his costume. Why not? <laughs> that does it. Dick! Just ignore them. That is the way noblemen dressed. There's nothing noble about this. I mean, now look at me. No, no wonder the Indians massacred these people. Don't feel bad. At least you don't look more beautiful than you've ever looked in your entire life. Thank you. <laughs> Officer Shiflett, don't you look authentic? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry to bust in like this, but I nabbed a traffic violator. Claims to be somebody here's father. My daughter works here. Alleged daughter. <laughs> Mr. Vanderkellen, Officer Shiflett, this is Stephanie's father. Okay, I've ID'd him. <laughs> Nailed him for two counts of driving against the parade. It was awful, batons everywhere. I had the right of way. How do you figure? I always have the right of way. <laughs> Not in my town. Mr. Vanderkellen, I'm, I'm Dick Lowe. How do you do? Well, it's a pleasure to, to finally meet you. <clears throat> what are you supposed to be? A nobleman. I guess while some people were carving out the wilderness, somebody had to stay home and dance backwards. Daddy! Princess! Daddy! Have you met Dick and 
Joanna the people who make me clean toilets? Oh, yes. And I'm George Utley, the man they make fixed toilets. Charles. Daddy, what are you doing here? I came to visit you, sweetheart. No, seriously. Stephanie, I know we've had our differences in the past, but now that I'm retired, I'm determined to spend more time with my family. Where's Mummy? I left her in Newport. Oh, she's on several fundraising committees, and her presence was needed, what with this save the $1,000 bill crisis. <laughs> I, I guess there's, there's no point in contributing money. So how long will you be in town? As long as my daughter can stand me. Come on, I'll make up a room for you if you promise not to watch. Stephanie, the, the rooms are all full. Oh, that's right. Who can we kick out? Uh, Stephanie, I really think I should take a room elsewhere. I'm afraid every room in town's booked for colonial days. It's a madhouse. I could even be looking at some mob control. <laughs> well, I've got a nice big room over the garage. If you want, we can set up a cot. George, I hardly think that Oh, that no, would... that would be fine. Lead the way, George. Something is seriously wrong with Daddy. What, what are you talking about? He, he seemed fine. Fine? Dick, my father just agreed to share a room with George over a garage and sleep on a cot. All right. <laughs> Three early warning signs. <laughs> Everything here is so authentic. Stephanie, you know the rules. Everything is supposed to be done the way it was in the old days. Okay, okay, okay. But it's not fair. Even the Flintstones had a vacuum. <laughs> Joanna, I, I can't work in this. Now I've lost my blue editing pencil. Well, Dick, you can't blame that on your costume. Yes, I can. I tried to stick it behind my ear and, and my wig ate it. <laughs> well, come on in and sit down. I'll look for it. While you're in there, see if you can find chapter three. <laughs> I'm Larry, this is my brother Daryl, and this is my other brother Daryl. And this is our friend Art. Daddy! Princess! Oh, you two are related? There's another faux pas for the record. Guess what, kitten? I was strolling through the woods and I came across these three chaps dressed as colorful 18th century woodsmen. Look kind of sartorially resplendent yourself, Art. Look, they're teaching me how to whittle. It's enormously relaxing and practical, too. This is going to be a grandfather clock. Well, we gotta go. Art, we want to thank you for that tip on the deferred investment credit. Okay, Daddy. Why are you acting so nutso? Can a fellow keep busy without having his sanity questioned? Here, stop worrying and buy yourself something. Oh, it's late. George promised to teach me how to chop firewood. I hope I don't get my grandfather clock mixed in with the kindling. Just remember not to put your pencil behind your ear. What's... What's wrong? Look at what my father just gave me. A hundred dollars. It all makes sense now. Daddy's not retired. He's broke. And he's obviously trying to cover by giving away huge sums of money. Dick, he used to give me more than this to buy gum. Stephanie, don't you think you might be jumping to conclusions? Well, what conclusion would you jump to if your father couldn't afford gum? <laughs> Daddy! Daddy, stop playing Paul Bunyan and get in here! 
You really mustn't yell at a person when he's swinging an axe. Daddy, don't try to deny that something's wrong because I know what it is. You do? Yes, and we'll survive. You can liquidate, and Mummy is always finding loose bullion in the sofa. Sweetheart, what on earth are you talking about? Our being poor. We're not poor. We're not? You mean your fortune, parentheses, my inheritance, close parentheses, is safe? Of course. It's nothing like that. It's just, well, I left your mother. Unavoidable. Your mother and I had a terrible row. And you left her? No, I left the screaming fishwife that had taken possession of her body. <laughs> this, this is kind of bordering on the personal. Now, maybe Dick and I should... No, I want the world to know what a maniacal shrew I married. Well, since, since you're backing off the personal stuff... <laughs> sound like mummy at all. The woman threw Wedgwood at me. No. Fortunately, I ducked, but she hit the Picasso. Fights at, at your house can, can really add up. <laughs> Daddy, what started all this? Who knows? One minute she was playing bridge with her club, the next she was using language that... Well, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that there was sailor blood on your mother's side of the family. <laughs> but you can't just walk out on 38 years of marriage. Oh, really? Just watch my dust. <laughs> Daddy! Did you ever get your father to hold still long enough to talk to him last night? No. So I telephoned Mommy and I tried to talk her into driving up here, but she wouldn't listen. I even pouted, but... It loses something over the phone. <laughs> oh, morning, honey. Did you sleep well? No, I was too excited about getting to, to wear this again. <laughs> Dick, it's the last day of the celebration. Tomorrow you can put on your old clothes. John, I know, honey. I've heard that once you've worn lavender satin, it's hard to go back. <laughs> Hello? Mommy! What are you doing here? I thought you said you weren't coming up. But I just couldn't forget what your father and I had meant to each other. Besides, what did you expect with the way you pouted on the phone? <laughs> Mommy, I'd like you to meet Dick and Joanna, the people who make me clean the glop out of drains with my hand. <laughs> Stephanie's told me so much about you. Well, I hope drain glop wasn't the high point. <laughs> Thanks, George. I never changed oil before. It's ever so much more fun than shipping it in from Kuwait. <laughs> what are you doing here? I came here to talk to you. You're wasting your time, Marion. There's nothing left to discuss, especially after you called me... that name. What name? The one that jumped right out of the gutter into your mouth. <laughs> Noodle head. The N-word again. Now, you all heard it. Well, of course I called you that. You mooned my bridge club. <laughs> I'm going to my study. I'm going to the kitchen. Garage. Wait, that won't be necessary. I'm the one who'll be leaving. Noodle head. Noodle head. Noodle head. What did I tell you? Sailor blood. <laughs> around. Do you want me to get her? No, no, no. Mr. Van der Kellen, you're not really leaving. Yes, I am. Would you please tell your husband that I hope we meet again under less bizarre circumstances? Now, there's nothing bizarre about a domestic squabble. I was talking about his clothes. <laughs> there he is, officer. Sorry, sir, you're in violation of Article 3, Paragraph 2 of the Colonial Day Celebration Bylaws. Now, what does that mean? You got trouble right here in River City? <laughs> the rule says all residents must dress up in colonial costumes. I don't think the Minutemen wore Italian shoes. <laughs> I'm not a resident. Paying to stay here? Well, no. And didn't but... I hear you say that you're staying indefinitely? Well, yes. You're but... a resident. 
You put him up to this. Well, you know how often I said that people who don't know how to dress properly should be taken off the streets. <laughs> What's going on? Dick, what happened to your costume? <laughs> Joanna, I'm sorry. I, I, I wasn't getting any work done. I, I kept uh, rolling my lace cuffs into my typewriter. <laughs> Whoa, look what got caught in the dragnet. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. What, what, what is this? Taking you in for non-compliance with the dress code. It's all part of the fun we call colonial days. <laughs> this is ridiculous. We can sue you for this. Go ahead. Maketh my day. <laughs> I don't want to say that. <laughs> all right, come on, come on. It's gonna be a little crowded. Hope you don't mind sitting in the back, Mr. Loudon. There's no way I'm getting on that horse. <laughs> Attorney. Sorry, the telephone won't be invented for another hundred years. Cheer up, gentlemen. Like I said, it's all part of the fun. Now, when the good times roll, this is where I want to be. <laughs> Time to make my rounds. I'll stop by later and scare the pigeons off you. <laughs> Stephanie, what is so important that you had to drag me down here like this? Well, you said that you wish Daddy would hold still long enough to talk to him. <laughs> Well, well, he couldn't get much stiller than that. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Dick. I'm sorry you got dragged into this, and you were working on your book, too. Hey, it, it really isn't that much of a disruption. <laughs> All right, Arthur, now that I've got you where I want you, What's going on? Leave me alone. Daddy, you're in no position to be stubborn. We can make you talk. Nobody can make me do anything. You're a proud man, aren't you, Daddy? <laughs> That's what I've always loved about you. You've always had your pride, your dignity, and your savoir faire. <laughs> All right, all right, I'll talk. Just take them off. Why did you humiliate me in front of my bridge club? Because your bridge club is stupid. You think the Democrats are stupid, but you never moved them. I was tempted in 72. Besides, you're always so busy with your clubs and charities, I didn't think you'd even notice. Notice? We all noticed. Mrs. Hodgkins buttered and ate the three of hearts. <laughs> this is absolutely ridiculous. Maybe this is none of my business, but I think what your husband is trying to say, that with you busy all the time, maybe you haven't been paying as much attention to him lately. When, when you're in stir with a guy, you, you get to know him. Father, I've always been busy with my clubs and charities. I had to be. You were always off earning gobs. But now I'm retired. They took my name off the door and put it on a plaque with a bunch of dead people. <laughs> Arthur, you're not making any sense. I, I think what he's trying to say is he, he, he feels like he's useless. Do you mind? This is a personal conversation. I'm sorry. I'll, uh, I'll move over there out of earshot. <laughs> Wait, Mummy. Usually, when Dick talks, I don't listen either. But this time, he might be on to something. Arthur? Are you feeling useless? How should I feel? The business is fine without me. The children are gone. My wife doesn't need me. I'm nothing. I feel like mooning the world. <laughs> Well, I had no idea you felt this way. You've always been so strong and confident. I know. I didn't want you to see me like this. Not like this, like this. <laughs> but, Arthur, I love you like this. I love you any way you are. Sweetheart, I love you too. Possibly this is a bad time, but could, could someone scratch my nose? <laughs> Here. Ma, 
Mommy, couldn't you drop one or two of your activities to make time for Daddy? Well, I suppose so. It's a sure bet the bridge club isn't coming back. And, Daddy, couldn't you go back to work part-time? Well, some people have been trying to entice me into helping them out of their financial crisis. Well, that's wonderful, Daddy. Who? The English. <laughs> what a pair of noodle heads we've been. Friends again? Yes, we are. Then consider yourself on parole. Oh. Now, don't show your mugs around here again unless they're in love. I'm thirsty. Let's go over and buy the lemonade stand. An unfriendly takeover. My author is back. Now that everybody is friends again, will you let me out of here so I can give my nose a real scratch? Sorry. His arrest was a setup. Yours was a righteous bust. You got another hour. What? And none of that. Part of the punishment. <laughs> folks, folks, could someone scratch my nose? It's, it's worth money. F five dollars to scratch my nose. Any, anybody, five dollars to scratch my nose? Stop, Dick. Stop what? Stop hiding your figs under the toast. <laughs> Joanna, don't be silly. I'm not hiding figs under my toast. <laughs> well, what do you know, figs? We talked about this before. Now you've got to start eating better, and that means getting more fruit in your diet. I don't like people telling me how to eat. That's why I became a grown-up. Not eating his figs. I was saving them for dessert. <laughs> Just try them, they're delicious. I hate figs. They're full of vitamins. I hate vitamins. That's dumb. Why would anybody hate vitamins? Because they come in things like figs. <laughs> Anything wrong? I think I'm gonna faint. I really think I'm going to faint. Stop clowning, Kirk. Wait, wait a minute. Wait. Oh, God. I don't think he's lying. Oh, God. Oh, no. Let's oh, get him to a chair. Kirk, Kirk. What happened? Get easy. Get easy. Here, I'll get me. a cold towel. I'll get him some water. I'll get him some figs. Dick. <laughs> Kirk, what's the matter? 
A man just held up my cafe. What? What? Was anyone hurt? No, fortunately, being breakfast, the place was empty. <laughs> well, what, what happened? This guy came into my cafe. He looked like all my other customers. Hostile, nervous, trembling. <laughs> I said, can I help you? He said, yeah. Then he grabbed my radio off the counter and threatened to hit me over the head with it if I didn't give him all my money. He actually said that? I think so. <laughs> all I could really hear was Melissa Manchester singing, Don't Cry Out Loud. <laughs> How, how much money did he get? All my life savings, $2,000. $2,000? You said you were broke. How'd you save $2,000? Same way as everybody else. It was my tax refund. <laughs> Kirk, this is terrible. Did you call the police? No, no. I was too upset to do anything like that. You, uh, you should call your insurance company. Them I called. <laughs> well, then just try to calm down. You weren't hurt, and your insurance company will reimburse you for everything. I hope so. I don't know. I don't trust anyone anymore. Kirk, it was just one incident. You, you can't stop trusting people. You don't know what it feels like to be threatened like that. I was terrorized, Dick. There's no telling what kind of psychological trauma I may have suffered. Right now, I'm, a, I'm afraid to walk out on the street again. Kirk, is there anything I can do? How about a movie? <laughs> Here you go. You'll be in room eight, and I'll have somebody bring your bags up in a minute. Uh, thank you. Oh, Dick, this is Mr. and Mrs. Powell. They're spending their honeymoon with us. Oh, congratulations. We hope you enjoy your stay here. Thank you. I'm sure we will. <laughs> well, here we go. Oh, I always think that's so romantic. Why didn't you ever carry me over the threshold? We talked about that, remember? We did? Yeah, I asked you if you wanted to go through a basically sexist tradition, and probably the two of us look like idiots, and you said, I guess not. Hi. I'm looking for the owner. Hi. You found him. <laughs> Hi. Tom Carson, World Mutual Home and Casualty. Oh, Dick Loudon, and we don't need any insurance. <laughs> Mr. Loudon, we're the uh, insurance carrier for the Minuteman Cafe. I'm investigating the robbery they had over there earlier this week. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just making my report. Need to ask a few neighbors some uh, routine questions concerning Mr. Devane's character. Well, I can certainly vouch for the fact that he's a character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How long have you known Mr. Devane? Uh, actually, not, not that long. But during the time you have known him, uh, he's impressed you as being uh, pretty reputable? Yes. Yes, he's... He's pretty, uh, pr pretty reputable. <laughs> of course, you know, it depends on your definition of, of reputable. <laughs> Would you say he's uh, basically an honest person? Yes. <laughs> basically. I'm just trying to determine whether or not Mr. Devane is an honest man. And I sense some evasiveness on your part. Huh. Well, I'm uh, cer certainly not, not trying to be evasive. <laughs> but then would you please just answer the question, yes or no? What, what question is that? Is Mr. Devane honest? Look, I, I'm sure Kirk didn't lie about the robbery. Are you saying he lies about other things? He, he fits. He... he uh, he, he fits for fun. He's, he's, a, he's a fun fibber. Mr. Loudon, what you're saying is very serious. No, 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 it isn't. Yes, it is. You're saying Mr. Devane can't be trusted. I never, I never said that. Never said what? I, I never said that Kurt couldn't be trusted. You say that all the time. <laughs> Who's this? Uh, George Utley. Do you know Kirk Devane? Sure. If you had to, would you describe him as basically honest or basically dishonest? Well, that depends. <laughs> On what? Who are you? <laughs> this is uh, Mr. Carson. He's investigating the robbery at Kirk's Cafe. See, anytime anyone claims to be robbed and we don't know whether or not they're telling the truth, we have to investigate. Well, I know Kirk is telling the truth. How do you know that? Well, because when Kirk told us about it, Dick said, I don't think he's lying this time. <laughs> well, 
I'd like to thank both of you gentlemen very much for your help. Uh, Mr. Carson, I, I hope we didn't give you the wrong impression of Kirk. Don't think so. <laughs> Shoot. What's wrong? Oh, I think I got Kirk in trouble. I feel like a traitor. I feel like the, the worst kind of turncoat. Oh, I feel the same way. Well, why? You didn't do anything. No, I meant about you. <laughs> That was delicious. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, we will. <laughs> Honey, I'm so glad you decided to let me make you a healthy breakfast for a change. Well, I guess one healthy breakfast isn't going to kill me. I know after you eat this, you're going to have more energy and you're going to feel better all day. Morning, Dick. <laughs> Morning. Morning, George. Would you, uh, pass the butter, please? Thank you. Would you pass the jam? the syrup, please? <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any powdered sugar? I can't eat this. Get you a stack of cholesterol and fat. Do you want to explain to me what happened over here yesterday? <laughs> Kirk, what are you talking about? I'm talking about someone singing like a canary to the insurance investigator. All right, Dick, here's your breakfast. Oh, sure. Sing like a bird, eat like a pig. <laughs> Is there a problem, Kirk? Problem? When that investigator left my cafe yesterday, everything was fine. Now he's snooping all over town, asking people questions about me. Apparently, someone has led him to believe I might not be telling the truth. I guess that would be Dick. <laughs> Kirk, Dick didn't tell the investigator anything he couldn't have heard from a hundred other people. But he might not have talked to a hundred other people if Dick hadn't told him I was a liar. I only said you lied occasionally. Couldn't you have stretched the truth? That was stretching the truth. <laughs> well, thanks to you, I'm trapped now. What do you mean? They've asked me to drive up to Burlington this afternoon to take a lie detector test. What's wrong with that? What if I don't pass? Kirk, if you're telling the truth about the robbery, you, you have nothing to fear. Dick, you know how I am. There's something inside me that won't allow me to tell the truth. I'm just afraid if they hook me up to that machine, I'll burst into flames. <laughs> right, would it make you feel better if I went along with you? Are you volunteering because you're my friend or because you feel guilty? Because I feel guilty. <laughs> Kirk, if you want me to, I'll go with you. <sighs> Thank you, Leslie, but I'd, I'd never drag someone I care about down into this slimy, seamy mess. <laughs> I'll take Dick. <laughs> If I pass out, you won't let my head hit the floor, will you? <laughs> Kirk, relax. It's going to be fine. This is all so sick, Dick. Hooking people up to machines, probing their minds, injecting them with electrical impulses, making them pay for parking. <laughs> Kirk, you don't have to go through this. I do if I want to get what's rightfully mine. The money I got from cheating on my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Devane, here's the water you asked for. Thanks. Could you throw it on the machine? <laughs> Uh, he's joking. 
And now, uh, Mr. Devane, as I said before, I'll be instructing you through the test. Uh -huh. You'll be asked a series of questions in random order. Your answers will be uh, registered according to your blood pressure, restoration, and skin response, so it is important that you remain calm. Calm. <laughs> Remember, all of your responses are to be yes or no. Yes or no. Do you understand? Yes. Very well. Let's begin. Is your name Kirk Devane? Yes. Are you a resident of Vermont? Yes. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yes. <laughs> Are you in this country illegally? Yes. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Kirk, Kirk, you're not even listening to the questions. What? You're not listening to what he's asking. What did he say? <laughs> Why uh, don't we begin again? Now, yes. just relax and pay attention. Okay, yes. Is your name Kirk Duvay? Yes. Do you run the Minuteman Cafe? Yes. Do you use illegal narcotics on a regular basis? Yes. <laughs> Wait a minute, he's doing it again. I don't understand. I'm not getting any variation. <laughs> you mean the, the machine isn't registering that, he, that he's lying? It barely registers anything. The pens haven't moved. According to this, he's in a coma. <laughs> well, may, uh, maybe the machine's broke. No, that, uh, it was working earlier today. Would you mind answering a few questions uh, just to test it? Uh, me? Well, it will only take a minute. Uh, here, just let me, uh, let me get you uh, unfastened here. There you go, you're free. Uh, would you stand up, please? Yes. <laughs> Kirk, would you hold my coat? Yes. <laughs> this, uh, this must be fascinating work. Yes. Never, never taken a polygraph test before, but then, then again, why, why would I? <laughs> what, uh, what do they call you? Uh, polygraphers? Polygraphists? Lie guys? <laughs> the, uh, the actual term is uh, polygraph examiner, but uh, you can call me Polly. <laughs> There, now that does it. Now remember to relax. Make all of your responses yes or no. Right. I, I mean yes. <laughs> Fine, then let's begin. Is your name Dick Loud? Yes. No. <laughs> my, uh, my, my friends call me, call me Dick, but my, my name is, is Richard Loud. Just answer yes or no. These aren't trick questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Are you a resident of Vermont? Yes, no. <laughs> what, what I mean is I, I live here now, but uh, I've only lived here for a couple months, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not sure I'm a legal resident. I'm doing it again, aren't I? It's all right. Uh, you do show that the instrument is definitely working. And then how, how do you explain his test? I can explain it. For some reason, he doesn't register on a polygraph. Well, what, what does this mean? If he doesn't register, it means there's nothing I can do to support his claim. I'm sorry. I'm sorry too, Craig. Looks like the only way I'm going to get my money back now is to go out and find the guy who stole it. How are you going to do that? We'll ask around. We'll start with the seediest place in town. Well, that would be your place. Okay, we'll start with the second seediest place. <laughs> Kirk, this, this is crazy. It's not crazy. This is the kind of place where crummy people hang out. Hi, Kirk. Hi, nice How's it going? Good to see you. What are we doing here? Looking for my robber. 
What do you gentlemen have? Look, we don't have time to order. We just want to know if you've seen anybody around here who might be a vicious criminal. What are you talking about? His cafe was robbed. He's trying to find out who did it. <gasps> oh, you must be from the Minuteman. See, they have heard about it. Everybody's heard about it. Oh, yeah. We were talking, and we figured whoever did it must be from out of town. Why's that? Well, because no one from this town would go in there. <laughs> did you want anything on the menu? No, no. Let's go. Just give me one last shot at it. What are you going to do? I'm not going to do anything embarrassing. I'm just going to offer a reward for any information leading to the arrest, conviction, and execution of the person who did it. <laughs> Kirk, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to make a plea for help, Dick. These people, cruddy as they are, are still my neighbors. And around here, neighbors are always willing to lend a hand. People, hello. Everyone, can you listen up, please, just for a second? Can you just listen up? Thank you. As you may or may not know, the Minuteman Cafe was robbed last week. <laughs> Say, would you teach me how to do that? Do what? So, George, why do you want to learn how to sew? Well, every once in a while, I knock a button off of one of my shirts, and I'd like to be able to sew it back on. This is one of your shirts. Oh, uh, well, never mind. <laughs> there you are. I thought you guys would have been back hours ago. How did the test go? You know how a vampire doesn't show up in a mirror? Kirk doesn't show up on a lie detector test. What do you mean? It was a waste of time. The test didn't prove anything. Well, if the test didn't prove anything, what happens now? Well, we don't know for sure, but it, it doesn't look good. Two thousand hard-earned bucks down the drain. Look, Kirk, I, I, know you're, I know you're feeling lousy, but I, it, I mean, it's not the end of the world. You know, you're right, Dick. I feel totally better. <laughs> All right, I, I know it's a cliche, but uh, instead of feeling down, just, you know, count your blessings. Okay, let's count them. I'm broke, I'm alone, I have no credibility, and I'm good-looking. That's one out of four. You know, I, I've been listening to you all day go on like this, and I'm, I'm trying to be sympathetic, but I, I think you're overlooking one thing. I mean, this, this whole ordeal is your fault. Let's give a hand for the most insensitive man in America. It's not insensitive, it's true. It's, uh, this whole ordeal is the, the classic story of the, the little boy that cried wolf. What story is that? <laughs> you never heard the story about the little boy that cried wolf? Nope. Well, it's a, it's a story about this, this little shepherd boy, and he was out watching over his lambs. His what? His lambs. You mean his sheep. Lambs are sheep. Honey, there's no such thing as a flock of lambs. I didn't say flock. It could have been a, a pair of lambs. I always heard it was goats. All right, whatever. Anyway, the, the point is, he, he was out watching over his herd of whatever, and, and he was bored, and he thought it'd be fun to, to run into town and, and tell everyone that, that he had seen a wolf. He cried wolf. What? Honey, I don't mean to interrupt, but you said the little boy went into town and told everyone he'd seen a wolf. Actually, he cried wolf, and the whole town came running. No, no, uh, the way I heard it, uh, only his mother and father came running. I thought everybody came running right away. But what, what difference does it make? It doesn't make any difference. Why are you telling the story? Uh, j just hear me out. The, the little shepherd boy kept crying wolf because he enjoyed fooling people. But he had cried wolf so much that when a wolf really came, no one believed him and no one came to help him. Is there supposed to be a point to this? Yes, the wolf ate his lambs. Sheep. Goats. I, I, thought, I thought the wolf ate the little boy. I don't care if the wolf ate the whole damn town. I mean, the moral of the story is that, is that someone or, or something somewhere somehow got, got eaten by the wolf because the little shepherd boy lied and no one believed him anymore. This is a religious story, isn't it? <laughs> no. 
understand what he's saying? If you lie all the time, no one's going to believe you. Even if you're telling the truth? That's right. That's exactly what happened here. All your chickens have come home to roost. <laughs> Why are you suddenly obsessed with livestock? Oh. Bert, what Dick is trying to say is that when you were telling all those lies, they may have seemed harmless. But at a time like this, you see, it's really important that people believe you. All right, just, just give me a second to uh, think about this. You're saying the $2,000 I lost is paying for all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of senseless and stupid lies I've told in the course of my life? I think that's right. It's not fair. <laughs> Who said life was fair? Uh, that, that might have been me. Let me get this straight. You all know the story, right? Yeah. Who told it to you? Our parents. Yeah. Can I use your phone, Dick? Sure. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> this is Kirk. Oh, come on, don't don't start crying. <laughs> I know it's been a long time. Since 1978? <laughs> Vermont. Yeah, I own a little cafe. Look, I, I don't have time to chit chat. <laughs> Mom, why didn't you ever tell me the story about the little boy who cried wolf? Well, they said it was a wolf. <laughs> Of course I love you. Do I have to keep telling you that over and over and over again? Every five years, I love you. everything mm, perfect good i mean if i had to come up with one complaint it would be that that my coffee is not quite hot enough but uh <laughs> you know, I, I can't imagine a situation <laughs> you know, where i would have to come up with a complaint <laughs> And how is our real maid, Stephanie, doing in Newport? The Vanderkellens are pampering my prego partner to death. <laughs> She's not sure she can survive another three-day facial. Morning, gang. Oh, hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Please feel free to sit in my seat. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Could you heat this up? That's what I pay me for. Nick, I came up with a great title for your Vermont Today special. Hidden shame, the silent burden. <laughs> What's with the snort, Harris? <laughs> well, it's just that when I was a VIP at PIV, I was on top of things. <clears throat> but then I was a professional producer, not some stage manager slash donut wrangler who just happened to kiss up to the right head cheese. I bet your professionalism comes in real handy now that you're a bag boy. <laughs> boys, boys. 
Are, are you saying that we aren't going to have any guests? Dick, it's not easy finding people who will talk about their shameful secrets, especially in a town where no one's done anything shameful. <laughs> I have to agree with, with Michael Snort. <laughs> I, I mean, with, without guests, you know, this show is, is going to be, to be lacking a, a certain something. Dick, don't worry, you'll have your guests. We're offering an incentive. Anyone appearing on Vermont today gets a free weekend at the Stratford. Oh, goody, more work for me. <laughs> Morning. Morning, George. Oh, hi, Paul. Oh, hi, George. Here, take my seat. I kept it warm for you. Ooh, you sure did. <laughs> See you Sunday, Dick. Bye, Joanna. Hey, Mikey. Clean up on aisle six. <laughs> Joanna, could you heat this up? Why didn't you just get Paul to sit on it? <laughs> well, Dixers, don't worry about your special on Sunday. I'm sure Paulie will find you gobs of guests. <laughs> You never told me you were doing a special Vermont today. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm part of your life anymore. <laughs> well, it isn't much of a special, George. The guests, if, if there are any, are going to talk about a, a hidden shame in their lives and then uh, spend a weekend at the Stratford. What a weird concept for a show. <laughs> Dick, would taking someone's car and driving it into a swamp be considered a hidden shame? Well, un unless you're one of the Dukes of Hazard, yes. <laughs> why, why, George? My hidden shame happened over 40 years ago. Uh, there was this street gang I wanted to join. Well, actually, it wasn't a street gang because the streets hadn't been paved yet. <laughs> it was more of a, a, a dirt road gang. <laughs> to pass my initiation, I had to sneak into a car, turn up the radio real loud, and then run like the Dickens. Tough gang. <laughs> anyway, I found a car with the keys inside and started it up so I could turn on the radio. But there was a problem. The car was in gear. Whoops. Yeah, that's what I said just before the car plunged into Johnny Cake's swamp. <laughs> Would you like to go on my show and, and tell your secret to the public? No, no. This, this whole town thinks of me as... Little Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. I'd hate to lose that image. <laughs> well, we, we could hide you behind the screen and, and, and alter your voice. Like you did with that guy that squealed on the mob? Tommy Azari. Is that who that was? No. <laughs> okay, you talked me into it. I'll do it. Great. Uh, what kind of curtain will I be hiding behind? Do you have anything in a red and white checkerboard with an inch-wide gold border? You know, it's just a plain old curtain. All right. Heat it up, Joanna. Heat it up, Joanna. How does Stephanie take this crap? <laughs> and now it's a special Vermont Today starring Dick Lawton. Hello and welcome to a special Vermont Today. We're calling Hidden Shame, The Silent Burden. <laughs> Our guests will be talking about the years spent living with shameful secrets and the joy they felt when they unburdened themselves. First up is Bruce Gordon. Hello, Bruce. Hi, Dick. It says here you are a compulsive gambler. How much would you say you lost during this period? Well, I've estimated at around 60,000 matchsticks. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, matchsticks is a term hardcore gamblers use to <laughs> refer to matchsticks. <laughs> so, uh, over the years, your habit must have cost you, what, 50 bucks? <laughs> Well, not that much, but... But it doesn't make my tale any less frightening. You see, I could never get my hands on enough matches. Eventually, I started stealing from my son's matchstick bridge. I kept praying he wouldn't notice the bridge getting lower. 
one day, he looked at me, he said, Daddy, what? Why doesn't my bridge have any clearance? <laughs> Our next guest <laughs> is Dorothy Benson. Mrs. Benson's shame involves the hopefully fascinating area of communications fraud. Hello, Dorothy. Hi, Dick. <laughs> now, what, what exactly do you mean by communications fraud? Well, <clears throat> for years, I phoned my sister in Palm Springs and never paid for one call. <laughs> and? Isn't that enough? <laughs> I phone Emily person to person and ask for someone fictitious. For instance, I would tell the operator I wanted to speak to Apollo, the god of the sun. <laughs> My sister would say, I'm sorry, Apollo just stepped out. <laughs> That was my way of telling Sis it was a sunny day here in Vermont. <laughs> You'd actually ask the operator for, for the god of the sun? Oh, not always. Now, I might ask for Neptune, the sea god, if I wanted Sis to know my toilet overflowed. <laughs> Hermaphrodites, to say I was feeling sexually ambiguous. <laughs> Our next uh, guilt-ridden guest, whose shame is so ugly he won't even show his face, once took a car and drove it into Johnny Cake Swamp. Better than matches and gods, huh? <laughs> Hello, vile Mr. X. <laughs> Mr. X? The old man behind the curtain. Who, me? I sound funny. <laughs> Hello? 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 <laughs> but, but can you adjust that thing? It sounds like I'm interviewing a Saturday morning cartoon. Sure thing, Dick. I had the same problem with Tommy Azari. <laughs> Okay, Mr. X, tell us in your own words, but not your own voice, what led to this hidden shame. Well, many years ago, I wanted to join this gang, the Vermont Hooligans. I had to find a car, turn up the radio real loud, then run. Well, I found a car, but there was one problem. <laughs> This car had been left in gear, so when I turned the key... Uh, Mr. X? Yes, Dick? That's George Utley. I just want to say congrats. Nay, super congrats. George popping his punum over that curtain was a brilliant fusion of tabloid TV and performance. <laughs> when you see him, w would you give him this? I talked him out of throwing rose petals at George's feet. <laughs> there he is, Dick. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dick. Well, goodbye, everybody. Where are you going? My guess is Hollywood called. <laughs> what do they sound like, George Young, I bet. 
I don't know what you're talking about, Michael, but then I never do. <laughs> Go west, old man. La La Land awaits. <laughs> well, it's been nice knowing you. G George, you, you, aren't, you aren't really going to La La Land. No, but I am going away to a place where no one's ever heard of Vermont today. It may mean going over that hill, but I'm prepared to do so. Oh, George, you can't run away just because of Dick's show. I mean, it's not like anybody watches it. Even if no one watched, word will get out. By nightfall, a torch-carrying mob will run me out of town. George, there might be a few small-minded people in the town, but even they'll forgive you for something that happened 40 years ago. You think? Well, you're right. These people are my friends. Thanks, Joanna. I guess, I guess I'll go unpack. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't have my mail forwarded or my features altered. <laughs> Attention. <laughs> At ease, Loudon family. What's up? We're informing everyone about the special meeting tonight. We're voting on whether or not to run George Utley out of town. <laughs> also, whether or not we should paint the gazebo. This is ridiculous. I told you that gazebo's a touchy subject. <laughs> you, aren't, you aren't really serious about, about running George out of town. The man committed a crime. It's our duty to rid this hamlet of scum. <laughs> I thought you liked George. We do. He's a lovely man. Being scum doesn't change that. <laughs> Historical footnote. My father, Officer Shiflett Sr., was sheriff of this town when the case of the DeSoto in the swamp with the radio on occurred. It was the one crime he couldn't solve. It eventually killed him. <laughs> Your father's still alive. <laughs> The story has more impact this way. <laughs> His dying wish was for me to become a peace officer and crack this case. Now that it's cracked, I can become what I always wanted, a night manager at Wendy's. <laughs> we should go. You know how long it takes to round up a mob. And getting it riled is a chore in itself. <laughs> Now that my secret's out, I feel like a cloud has been lifted. The sky's bluer, the grass is greener. Jim and Chester and Officer Shiflett were just here. I'll go pack my bags again. <laughs> Once again, we'd like to thank George Utley for his fine work organizing this year's Ye Old Apple Day Festival. Let's hear it for George. <laughs> so fast, George, is still the matter of running you out of town. Uh, I was hoping you'd forget. Normally I might have, but since Jim gave me a beautiful pack of pen for my birthday, I've been writing everything down. 1995. <laughs> now for the reason we're here. All those in favor of running George... George? Oh, uh, before you vote, I'd like to say something in my behalf. Oh. It was Joanna's idea. <laughs> the truth is... I'm guilty as sin. What I did was wrong. Just plain misguided and really, really dumb. I'd like to change what I did, but I can't. I just hope you'll find it in your hearts to forgive me and let me stay here until I die. Thank you. Okay. All in favor of running George out of town, raise your hand. <laughs> The citizens have spoken, George. You have 24 hours to get out. I say we give them till high noon tomorrow. That's the traditional getting out of town time. <laughs> well, I thought sundown was the traditional getting out of town time. No, sundown is when all the beautiful flowers close their petals and sleep. <laughs> Someone should install a stupidity alarm in here. <laughs> Those things are no good, Dick. Mine's always going off for no reason. Okay, thank you all for coming. 
And George, thanks again for a triumphant ye old apple day. Bye bye, George. Call oh, once in a while, pal. <laughs> but this this is idiotic. You you people are such a a, a bunch of hypocrites. I mean, everyone in this room has done at least one shameful thing. <laughs> Haven't you ever heard the expression, let he who is without sin cast the first stone? As town librarian, I'm fairly certain that quote's from the Bible. Well then, as a God-fearing Presbyterian, <laughs> there is something I'm hiding. It has to do with how Chester won the last election for mayor. <laughs> Jim Dixon, you said you'd go to your grave with that secret. Well, that was before Dick made me cave in with that fire and brimstone speech. <laughs> well, I don't want to spend eternity in the hot place. Go ahead, Dixon, spill your guts. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, remember how Chester won with 50 more votes than there are people in this town? <laughs> Well, that was because he stuffed the ballot box. Oh, Let's run Chester Wanamaker out of town. As long as we're being loose-lipped, why don't you tell us how a man who makes 19000 a year can own a 12-room beach house in fabulous Waikiki? <laughs> Let's run Jim Dixon out of town. And to really punish him, let's give his beach house to me. Right. As long as we're talking about sex, <laughs> I confess, I am a wanton woman. It's true. I've had intimate relations with several of the married men in this town, and I'm prepared to name names. <laughs> to name names now. Uh, you, you just saw three people confess. No, actually, nine people. <laughs> now, I, I want to see the hands of everyone else in the room who has a hidden shame. <laughs> what, what did you do? I don't want to talk about it. It happened days before I married you. <laughs> days? Dick's right. We've all done shameful things. Yeah. But not George. After all, his misdeed was a youthful prank. Our sins were much more heinous and premeditated and sometimes committed three times in one night. Gee, I never heard of a whole town being run out before. Where would we go? Well, uh, I have an idea. Since we've all done things to be ashamed of, couldn't we just stay here? I mean, this town is too big for one person, and I'd miss you guys. Okay, I move. We stay here for George's sake. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Motion is carried. Town stays where it is. Oh. Dick, thanks for defending me like you did. George Young, a lot of this was, was my fault. Hey, you're right. Then, uh, thank you and damn you. You're welcome, and I'm sorry. I hope you'll start coming to the library. I'd like to take you into the stacks and show you a world you never knew existed. <laughs> Tell me again why we left New York. You thought New Yorkers were too eccentric? Right. You want to move back? Oh, I could never show my face in that city again. Not after... Not after what? Oh, nothing. Would you feel more comfortable talking behind a curtain? <laughs>